problem being solved in some sense begins with the fact that trial court judges always hate patent cases. And the reason the trial court judges hate patent cases is for a single trial judge, a lawyer who has spent his or her life doing litigation, a patent case in which she or he is going to be required to find detailed facts about how paint is made or how computers work or how radio broadcasting operates is an opportunity just to be made into a fool. Congress is attempting to change the system in which patent cases are litigated. But instead of changing who tried patent cases, Congress left the non-specialist district judge in charge of the trial and then created a new court of appeals called the Federal Circuit, whose job it was to hear all appeals from patent cases. Rapidly, of course, this court filled up with patent lawyers. And the patent lawyers then made the law in the Court of Appeals that applied to all those district judges who were still making non-specialist decisions of which they were afraid. Naturally, the Federal Circuit turned out to be a place which loved patents. And its chief judge, Giles Rich, who lived to be very, very old and died in his late 90s, was a man who particularly loved patents on everything. The Federal Circuit Court under Giles Rich sort of broke diamond against deer loose from its original meaning and came to the conclusion that software itself could be patented. The Supreme Court basically left everything to this court to decide. The PTO actually used to reject patents on software like in the early 1990s and they did not allow them and the applicants would appeal those rejections to the Federal Circuit. In the world of machines, you showed the patent office the machine, and you got a patent office whose claims were, I claim this machine. In the world of computer software, there was no way of defining what the unit was. I don't claim a program, I claim a technique that any number of programs doing any number of things could possibly use. The consequence of which is that very rapidly we began to build up as real estate that somebody owned and could exclude other people from a whole lot of basic techniques in computer programming. What happened was, starting in the mid-90s, the, the numbers of patents on software started soaring. Uh, and industry attitudes started changing, too. So you had Microsoft, which originally didn't deal with software patents very much at all. I guess they got sued in the early 90s by Stack and lost a, a significant judgment against them. They started patenting. They're going to have their own, their own set of patents so that if a major patent holder threatens them, they can fire back. Gradually, companies like Oracle were forced to set up patent departments just for defensive reasons. They had to patent their stuff so that they had something to trade with uh, companies that had patents. And so the arsenals start to develop. And by the 2000, you know, year 2000, 2001, Microsoft now holds you know, thousands of software patents. Oracle was probably approaching a thousand software patents. Adobe. You know, all of them have become more and more aggressive patenters, and some of the ones who were against software patents ended up suing other companies. And, and so you, you, what, you, what you've had is an explosion of patenting first, and then an explosion of litigation. By the late 90s, uh, about a quarter of all patents granted were software patents. Uh, about a third of all litigation, patent litigation, involves software patents. About 40% of the cost of litigation is attributable to software patents. And those numbers have been going up. So uh, Charles Freeney invented a, a kiosk that goes in retail stores. Uh, and the idea is you'd come in, you could s select the music selection, swipe your credit card, put in a blank nine-track tape, and this is, this is how long ago this patent was. Uh, and it would write that music selection onto the tape and you could go away with it. 
Uh, the patent was drafted in a very, you know, this very vague language, so there was, there were terms like point of sale location and information manufacturing machine, and uh, Freeney uh, eventually sold this patent to somebody who wanted to interpret those terms very broadly um, to basically cover e-commerce. Uh, so he, here was this, you, you know, the, this very limited invention for uh, this kiosk, and he wanted to interpret those terms in such, broad, in such a broad way that it would cover transactions that took place over the internet, that you could, they, they could be, you could make them in your office, in your bedroom, in your house, uh, anywhere. Uh, and, and so it covered virtually all of e-commerce. Um, the courts initially didn't agree with that interpretation, but it, they appealed it, and the appellate court largely agreed with them, uh, and they were able to extract uh, uh, some settlements out of oh, well over 100 companies. Um, but the, the, the significant thing is, he, here is this patent. You can't tell what its boundaries were until you get to the appellate court. What most people thought the, its boundaries were turned out to be wrong. One of the key properties of a programming language is very, very precise. You can look at any, any programming language in any language, you know, any uh, C, or Python, or any language like this, and you know exactly what it's doing. And you can say, you can look at two pieces of source code, and you can say, you know, are this doing the same thing or different things? Um, and, and we do this because computers are very picky, and, and we need to uh, tell the computer exactly what we need to do in order to accomplish some task. Um, the, the, patent, uh, the, the language the patent lawyers use is almost the opposite. Um, there's an advantage in being vague and in being broad and being nonspecific because the broader your language, um, the more uh, things you sort of catch in your net. So it is a large problem in our patent system just defining simply what is the context or the borders of the patent. And, you know, what does it cover, what does it not cover? And that ambiguity causes a lot of chilling effects because people are going to avoid doing anything that could possibly be covered by the patent, even if in reality the patent wouldn't cover what they want to do. Let's imagine that in the 1700s, the governments of Europe had decided to promote the progress of symphonic music, or as they thought, promote it, with a system of musical idea patents, meaning that anybody who could describe a new musical idea in words could get a patent, which would be a monopoly on that idea, and then he could sue anybody else that implemented that idea in a piece of music. So a rhythmic pattern could be patented, or uh, a sequence of chords, or uh, a, a set of instruments to use together, or any idea you could describe in words. Now imagine it's 1800, and you're Beethoven, and you want to write a symphony. You're going to find it's harder to write a symphony that you won't get sued for than write a symphony that sounds good. Because to write a symphony and not get sued, you're going to have to thread your way around thousands of musical idea patents. And if you complained about this, saying that this was getting in the way of your creativity, the patent holders would say, oh, Beethoven, you're just jealous because we had these ideas before you. Why should you steal our ideas? People have been making music for, for thousands of years. You know, there, there, were never, there was never any need for patents in the field of music. And since the computer industry has made programming possible. People have been developing software as well for you know, since right since the beginning. There was never a need to have patents in this field in order for the the activity to, to happen. Most everything we were doing back uh, before 1980, not before 1981, those things patents played no no role in it. Uh, cut and paste. Um, uh, the, the embedded ruler in word processing, uh, word wrapping, a lot of the things that are real important that we take for granted and that are much, much more innovative in many ways than many patents that we have today, because patents can be on some very, very minute, um, minute things, and that's the way the law works. Um, that, those things happened. We had great advances without patents.